Hello, welcome to another video, and it is time for the mid-year book freakout tag. Did I just get that right the first time? I always get confuddled with the title of this mid-year book freakout tag. I got it right. I always want to get the words like the wrong way around, or I don't want to get the words the wrong way around, but I do. Regardless, it's part way through the year. We're halfway-ish, so it's time for the mid-year book freakout tag, and that is what we're gonna do. I have got these questions from Steph, from Steph Love's version that she did, and when I was writing them down, I did notice that there's a couple on here that I don't think I've answered in years previous, so I don't know if the questions have been shifted or where she sourced them from, someone had like adapted them or something. I don't know, but I got them from Steph's channel, so I will paste the questions that I'm answering down below in the description. So, let's just crack on with it, shall we? Uh, the first question is the best book of 2023 so far, and it should come as no surprise that it's Malevolent Seven by Sebastian de Castell. It's a Sebastian de Castell book, of course it's my favourite book of the year so far. I fucking love it. I love him. I love anything this man writes. It just gels with me. His writing style just meshes with me so well. I love the way the narrator like breaks down that wall and talks directly to you as a reader and the like sarcasm and wit that comes across in his writing. I feel like I say this so often, like every time I talk about Sebastian de Castell's writing, the things that I love about it have not changed. And this being his newest release um, on Core Pile, it has got the highest rating so far this year. I don't know if like maybe I'm a little bit biased because I love the writing style so much, because this book didn't necessarily have the biggest like emotional impact. Like, there are other books that I've read this year that have had a bigger emotional impact, but the writing style that Sebastian has just makes me feel so good when I read it. Like, I have so much fun reading his writing style that I think it just naturally sways me towards higher ratings. So, this one's come out on top. This one is about a mercenary wanderist named Cade, and uh, he used to have a much more noble sounding job until he worked out that the people that he was working for were maybe not quite as noble as he assumed. He is doing some stuff with magic that he probably shouldn't be doing, and ends up being part of a mission where they must collect a group of seven to uh, beat a big bad evil but, like, is it beating a big bad evil? Or are they the big bad evil? Who's the good guys here? Really not sure, because war mages are not pretty. War mages are selfish, and this book will show you what a real war mage looks like. It was action-packed, it was funny, it was gruesome in places. I freaking love it, and, uh, recommend, of course. The next question on this list is the best sequel of 2023 so far, and for this one I am going with book three of the Lycanius trilogy. I totally just blanked on the word Lycanius. Uh, the Light of All That Falls by James Islington. I think it's Islington. I always want to say Islington, but I'm pretty sure it's Islington. So book three of the Lycanius trilogy that starts with The Shadow of What Was Lost. We then have An Echo of Things to Come and The Light of All That Falls. The first book follows our main trio of characters who are part of a uh, magical community of people. However, in this world, magic is entirely looked down upon. There was a particular like guild of magic users in the past that caused a war, were the uh, root of many a problem, and magic is therefore completely looked down upon. So anyone who is a magic user has to go through this particular school, learn how to entirely control and be shackled by their magic, and um, held by a certain set of rules. Our main character finds out that he is one of these long lost types of magicians. He is an augur, um, and the discovery of this sends him on a wild journey which involves weird timey-wimey stuff that got me a little bit confused in the middle. There are people that have done terrible things, there are people who have had their memories and their magic stripped, and our main character and this particular guild of magicians is at the centre of everything, causing an uprising of sorts. I find this series very difficult to describe, simply because there's so much going on, and I feel like even mentioning certain things is kind of spoilery, but 
if you like talk of prophecy and fate and how much of the future is like within your control and how much is already planned and mapped out for you and whether the choices you make are predetermined and things like that, there's a big discussion of that within this book that I found incredible, or not just this book, but this trilogy that I really enjoyed. There's obviously a lot of politics, a lot of magic, secret identities, as I say, the time stuff. So we have like future people, past people, and it gets a little bit confusing in the middle. Lots of hints of things that don't make sense until you've got the whole picture. And I love that feeling of being kind of confused until you've got the whole picture, which is why I think this is a fantastic sequel, well, conclusion. Um, and and uh, yeah, the best sequel of the year so far for me. The next question is the best reread or the favourite reread of the year so far. And mine has got to be Ruin of Kings. I'm actually part way through my reread at the point of filming this, but as you can see, I am tabbing and annotating as I go. This is part of my Patreon buddy read. We are reading the whole Chorus of Dragon series on my Patreon, um, starting with The Ruin of Kings in June, and I have been loving it. Um, I'm hoping next week to actually get through like the remaining chunk of this, because I am loving my reread, loving all the things that I'm able to tab and pick out, and oh, it's just fantastic. This series is honestly another one I struggle to describe because I feel like just so much happens and there's so much going on, but it follows our main character, Kirin, and Kirin is unknowingly at the centre of a number of prophecies. He's wanted by gods, he's wanted by royalty, he's wanted by dragons and demons and everything in between because he is pivotal to a much bigger picture than he is aware of, because as far as he knows, he's just a little orphan boy, apprentice to a musician, little thief on the side, you know, he's just living his lowly life until he realises um, that he is the long-lost heir to one of the royal families, and he's taken into their world, and it is not all luxury, and he is completely sucked into the family's ruthless schemes, and attempts to escape this just make things worse for him. As I said, he's part of a number of prophecies for gods, demons, dragons, everything in between, but the result of this prophecy is a little bit unknown, as we don't understand really if Kirin is destined to save the world, or destroy it. This series is one of my absolute favourites, I adore it, five star the whole time, like 50 pages into this the first time I read it I knew it was going to be five stars on my reread, I'm having the time of my life, so it's got to go to this one. Next up is the genre you've been reading the most of or loving the most, and for me that is always going to be fantasy, I don't think that is a surprise to anybody. I am a massive fantasy reader, I just, I love it fantasy is my jam. Um, I don't really read an awful lot of much else, and I'm okay with that because I know what I like, and it's fantasy books. Uh, next up is a new release that you haven't got to yet but want to, and for me, that would be Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. Everybody and their mother has been going on about this book, wanting to read this book, reading this book, loving this book. It has been an absolute social media sensation, uh, not just going to limit that to a TikTok sensation, a social media sensation because it has been everywhere. Everyone loves it. I don't really know what this is about other than there are four quadrants and if you are a dragon rider, like, that's super dangerous. Like, a dragon without its rider is a tragedy, a rider without its dragon is dead or something like that? Is that, is that the way that goes? Oh, brutal and elite war college. Ooh, yeah. I don't know anything about this and I would still like to go into it not really knowing too much about what it's about. I would like to lower my expectations but they're already through the roof because of how incredibly popular it's been. I need to get to it sometime soon. Maybe I should let the hype die down a little bit, I don't know, but 
I I can't quite believe I haven't read this yet, and I really need to. Next up, we have the most anticipated releases for the remainder of the year, and a massive one for me is The Fragile Threads of Power by V. E. Schwab. This is the first book in the Threads of Power trilogy, the continuation to the Dark Shade of Magic trilogy. I'll pop the cover here. The UK cover was released yesterday at the point of filming this. That's very exciting. I think it comes out in September. I think. Can I remember? Mm. Um, I'm very excited about this. Knowing what it's about, not too clear for me, I'll be honest with you. I'm sure I've read a blurb somewhere and have just entirely forgotten it, but it's Victoria Schwab. I love Victoria Schwab. The Shades of Magic series is one of my favourites. It has my favourite character of all time, Delilah Bard, in it. Um, so I'm so eager to get back to this world, back to this magic, back to more incredible Victoria Schwab, so very excited about that. But another one I want to mention as well that I am super excited about is The Art of Destiny by Wesley Chu. This is the sequel to The Art of Prophecy, and it's actually a duology, so is the conclusion to the uh, war art saga, I think it's called. I've been raving about The Art of Prophecy for so long. I say so long. It feels like so long now because all I've done since I read it is rave about The Art of Prophecy, but it was only a couple months ago. I love The Art of Prophecy so much. I can't wait f for the sequel. I want to reread Art of Prophecy before Art of Destiny comes out. And again, I think that's another September release. So September is shaping up to be very exciting. Next up is the biggest disappointment of the year so far. And I'm incredibly disappointed to say this, but it is Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. I actually have like soft DNF this and I am shocked. I'm so shocked. I thought I was gonna love this. I stopped in the middle of a chapter. I'm like 150 odd pages into this and I'm just not feeling it. I'm not loving it. I'm not drawn to picking it back up and I really need to sort that out. I thought I would have loved this a whole lot more with it being Brandon Sanderson. So many people love Warbreaker. After Mistborn Era 2 and how much I didn't enjoy that one and all the great things I was hearing about this one, I really expected it to pick back up to the Brandon Sanderson that I loved in Mistborn Era 1 and Elantris. And I'm just not getting that from this. So I'm incredibly disappointed so far. I will continue this because I obviously want to continue with the Cosmere, but I just have not been having a great time with this one and I'm really disappointed and it just wasn't what I expected at all. So that kind of sucks, but I will continue it eventually, I promise. Following on from that, we have the biggest surprise of 2023 so far. And for me, that is Serpent and the Wings of Night by Carissa Broadbent. This is a fantasy romance that took social media by storm earlier this year with vampires and romance and fantasy romance and vampires are two things that I typically do not reach for and do not really enjoy but something about this I think it was the hype I was sucked in by the hype uh, I just had to give it a go so I did I do have a dedicated reading blog for this I will link it up top somewhere whichever side it is but I enjoyed this more than I anticipated I didn't hate it didn't hate the romance, it was quite a slow going romance. Uh, the action was good, there were some political elements to it that I enjoyed as well. I had a better time than I thought I was going to and actually I feel like I read it quite quickly as well. Like It was quite an easy and um, fast paced read. So that one took me by surprise because it actually got a pretty decent rating in the end and that is not what I expected from a vampire fantasy romance and me. <laughs> Next one on the list is new favourite author, either debut or new to you, and I think I'm going to go for a new to me author in Matthew Ward, the author of the Legacy trilogy, Legacy of Ash, Legacy of Steel, and Legacy of Light. I have not yet read Legacy of Light still. Uh, I think I'm a little bit scared of it, to be honest, uh, but I loved Legacy of Ash, adored Legacy of Steel, read them back to back, could not stop, just gobbled up both of them and fell in love with the story, the grittiness of this world, how angry these characters made me, how invested I became in their lives and the politics and the relationships and just everything. I just loved it. 
it was so good. Uh, so this trilogy is about a republic where the southern territories tried to break away from the republic in years past, however that rebellion was squashed. They're now a group of people that's kind of looked down upon by the rest of the republic as less than them. The republic are so focused on their internal quarrels that they don't really pay enough attention to a bigger external threat from an external nation that wants in on the attack. So we've got lots of the political elements that I like in this with your internal conflict blinding you to a bigger external threat and the need to just team up to fight this bigger external threat, but then it gets so much deeper when these politics start being played with by the gods and people are being used as pawns by the gods for a greater game and we've got the little sprinkles of the magic of this world throughout. Um, early in Legacy of Ash, I was a bit like, oh, where, where is this magic that I was anticipating? And then it comes in. I think it was around the, like, 400-page mark. I was then just, like, absolutely so enthralled by this. Could not stop. Needed to consume the whole thing. It was just go, go, go. And that continued into the second book. I loved it. Again, I have not a dedicated vlog, but the vlog where I did read both Legacy of Ash and Legacy of Steel back to back. I will link that for you as well. I had the best time and you can see in that vlog how much I just fell in love with these books and I think Matthew Ward has to be one of my like new favourite authors for that reason. I could also say James Arlington, but I've already mentioned James Arlington elsewhere, but he would also count. So both of these, really. I've been into the uh, chunky book authors, it would seem. <laughs> Next up we have new favourite character, and uh, there is one character that I have been thinking about since I started reading about her, and I didn't really want to have to repeat books in this, I wanted to try and keep it all different, but it's Anastasia from the Legacy Trilogy. I just am a little bit obsessed with her. I think she's awesome. Don't know what she is. She's got some funky stuff going on, but she is a fascinating character. I love her attitude. I love her sass. I love the way she approaches the world. Um, I think Anastasia is a top-notch gal. Moving on. Uh, next up we have a book that has made you cry so far this year. Um, there has been a few, actually. Our Wives Under the Sea made me cry a little bit, which kind of took me by surprise, so I could have mentioned that, but the one I've gone with is Wrath by John Gwynn. The ending of this series did make me cry, and I think that just has got to be expected from the last book in a series where you've become so invested in these characters and the plot and the outcome of it all. Um, so when we got to the end of this and had, you know, what's left after the books. It did make me cry. I loved this series. Again, political fantasy, war, gods, angels, darker creatures, a prophecy with a bright star and a dark sun. Um, so we have a very classic prophecy of like the saviour and the evil and determining who is who throughout this series and how that prophecy will play out and the importance of it and what it means for this world. Um, but there is also giants and magic and internal politics and conflicts and stuff as well. So again, all the political things that I love in my political fantasy with prophecy and magic. I have a very clear type. Can you see it? <laughs> Next up we have a book that made me happy and I kind of hmm, struggled with this a little bit for a book that made me happy and in fact I'm still not entirely sure that the answer I've got here is like the best answer I could have could have given. Actually, no, scrolling through it again. I mean, when I say makes me happy, I don't know if I mean that in the right sense for this question, but The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi by Shannon Chakraborty. This adventure made me happy. The atmosphere of this made me happy. The characters I really thoroughly enjoyed. I love Shannon Chakraborty's writing, so the whole experience of this 
made me happy, but I don't want to say it's necessarily like a feel-good, upbeat, happy read. Do you know what I mean? But looking through my core pile list for the year, I don't think I've actually read many feel-good, happy, upbeat books this year, so I'm gonna go with one that I enjoyed and therefore that made me happy. One of my five star reads for the year, I think I have again mentioned like all of my five star reads. I recently did a like best books of the year so far video. I think they're all just cropping up in this video again to be honest. But this follows the story of Amina al Sarafi, legendary pirate captain, and the stories that surround her and how she has become legend. Um, but if you want to know about the legend of Amina al Sarafi, you had better hear about her adventures from her. So this is Amina telling her story about how she would do anything to save her family ultimately, and her family being her blood family and the family that her crew became to her, and how she got the reputation that she got in the end. I love the found family in this, I do love the mother-daughter relationship in this, the adventure, the atmosphere, the magic, the just good time that I had reading this. And I loved the way that it ended with the reveal for the narrator. So there is like a narrator that is almost interviewing Amina throughout this. The way it's told is really fantastic, by the way, with like the narrator's interruption or Amina's interruption of the narrator and stuff. It is really well told. And I listened to the audiobook too, and the audiobook is also very good. Um, but I really enjoyed the reveal at the end with that. I think that was so well done. And I just had such a good time with it completely recommend if you are a fan of like the Deva Bad trilogy and you haven't read this, I recommend because it's got all the right vibes that that had as well. And obviously Shanna Chakraborty's writing is top notch, so made me very happy. Next on the list is the most beautiful book that you have acquired this year. And for me, I was looking around my shelves, but I don't think anything quite competes with the fact that this book is holographic. Like, it's got the holographic foil underneath, like, it's just, it's just gorgeous. It is just gorgeous. But you know what? A lot of fairy loot editions that have come out this year, the fairy loot edition of Amina al Sarafi as well is gorgeous. But holographic cover? Can you beat it? But as I say, there are a lot of fairy loot special editions that I've got. I get the YA and the adult box. Um, I do subscribe to both of those, so I acquire a lot of beautiful books from fairy loot. Uh, next on the list is books that you need to read before the end of 2023, and there are... <sighs> about 300 that I would love to get to. However, my top priority books are the ones that were mentioned in my top 10 priority TBR at the beginning of the year, and I think the ones that I have left on that are Day of Fallen Night by Samantha Shannon, The Grace of Kings by Ken Liu, is it Ken Liu I think? Emperor's Blade by Brian Staveley, and Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wang. Are they the last ones on that list? I think they might be. So they're the ones off the top of my head that I definitely want to get to by the end of the year. Um, but obviously I also need to read Legacy of Light, which is the last book in the Legacy trilogy. I'm going to be rereading the rest of the Chorus of Dragons series as well. Um, there's plenty of books that I would like to get to before the end of the year, and fingers crossed, the reading role that I have been on, I can keep up. That would be pretty nice. Uh, next up is a question I don't recall having been on here before, but what's the fa what's your favourite video or post that you've made so far this year? Um, and I think my favourite video that I've made, it's a toss up really, I can't decide which one is my favourite out of the video of Comic-Con where I met Sebastian de Castell, the I met my favourite author vlog, or Finn's day out in Manchester, because that vlog was kind of different. It was way more like from Finn's point of view, it was much more like following my Sheba around Manchester. I, I really like both of those videos, but I think I like them both for 
very much personal reasons. Like, they're not the best performing videos. They're not the videos that I've had, like, the best feedback on or anything. They're just the videos that hold special places for me for very personal reasons. Like, a video all about my dog's day out, and I feel like that was just such a good way to, like, make a memory of a day out with Finn that's now immortalised on the internet. Um, and also, obviously, meeting Sebastian de Castell was a big moment for me, because I love him. <laughs> so, those. And then, finally, last on the list is to name some of your favourite community members. And I... <laughs> I don't think I can do this because there would be too many names to names. So first off, all of my patrons, like I cannot put into words how thankful I am for every single one of my patrons and their support. Like it means so much to me always, but right now with my life kind of being turned on its head for a little bit, like that support from them just means so much to me and I'm so grateful for every single one of them. The friendships that we have made, the things that we have been doing together, like I just love my Patreon community and I'm so grateful to every single one of them. As well as that though, every single one of you that watches, comments, likes, subscribes, like again, it means so much and I'm so grateful to all of that. Like all you regular commenters, like I know icons and usernames and stuff and I just value all of you so very much. Of course, my friends, my near and dear friends, do they count as members of the book community or just like my, my friends? I'm grateful to them all. And then obviously my fellow creators that I adore their content of and adore them personally. I'm not gonna go and like list a bunch of them because it'll be just my luck that I'll forget someone, so all of my fellow creators are fantastic and I love them all. Like everyone brings their own thing and I am very honoured and privileged to be part of such a great community of people all round. That seems like a really soppy answer. Anyway, <laughs> that is the mid-year book freakout tag. Did I get that right again? I hope you have enjoyed. If you have, give us a thumbs up, chat to me down below, all that good stuff. Let me know your answers to some of these questions, or if you are a fellow creator, go ahead and do the tag yourself. Um, whether with these questions that have some additions in, it seems, or the original set, or whatever, I don't know. Um, but I hope you have enjoyed, and I shall see you in whatever comes next. Bye.